How many people haven't been here before? Let's say, there's a lot of people who haven't been here before, right? Great. Thank you all for coming. So this uh, this is Jones River Landing Environmental Heritage Center, home of Jones River Watershed Association. If you've walked around at all, you've kind of gathered that we, we have our environmental component and then also the, the boat building component in the back shop here. Um, that's a, a product of the fact that we, we bought this place basically to protect it. And um, when it was for sale 10 years ago, Pine-ish? 2003. Yeah. So almost 15 years ago. Uh, and upon buying it, started to learn the history of it. And it had been continuously operated as a boat shop since the uh, 1700s. And so it, we weren't going to be the ones to put an end to that history. So we've maintained the boat building program here too, making this the longest continuously operated boat shop in the country. Boat yard. Boat yard. <laughs> there's a different Careful with our distinctions. But there's been, you know, there's been boats since the, the brig independence in, uh, you know, the first ship of the colonial Navy was built here. The, the keel was laid here. Um, and so a lot of history, and um, so we're happy to have that component as well as the environmental piece. Um, I'm going to pass around a, a sign-up sheet if you're interested in getting on our uh, on our newsletter. We do a lot of programs here, uh, typically not in the middle of the day like this, typically more um, evening seminar series things. Uh, if you're interested in the boat shop, Wednesday nights, every Wednesday night is an open house uh, boat, boat work. So if you're interested in that, come by. There's a group of people who work on the boats every week. They're happy to have new faces. Um, sometimes it's more coffee drinking, sometimes it's more boat building, uh, but it's always pretty interesting. So um, stop by if you're interested in that. Um, just very quickly so we can get moving, but Jones River Watershed Association is is working, as you probably know, on, on a lot of water related, watershed related issues. Um, everything from water quality to things like dam removal, we're working on another dam removal now, uh, to stream flow issues, uh, you know, basic protection of our, our resources. And uh, one thing I want to bring up, because I know we have a big contingent from, from Plymouth, is um, Jones, River watershed, uh, Jones River Watershed Association is part of the Watershed Action Alliance, which is a consortium of watershed associations uh, in southeastern Massachusetts. And so we deal with a lot of issues like come to meetings. And um, we recently had a uh, conference last uh, this past spring, cyanobacteria being one of the hot topics at that conference. Um, but one of, the, one of the things that we've just been talking about a lot recently is uh, the Water Management Act and the availability of water southeastern mass. And it, it, there's a lot of impacts to, to the Jones River and also in Plymouth too because the way the new regulations, and we, we have DEP here but I won't, I know George isn't involved with the, the swimming <laughs> part so don't take it out on George. But, um, he's on our side. The, he's on our side. The, uh, you know, the, new, the new regulations, the new changes in the Water Management Act have new allocations for water withdrawals and they're lumped by pretty large bases. So in the case of Plymouth, Eel River could theoretically have all of its water allocated with no stream flow left. That's the same with Jones River because they're lumped into these bigger bases that include the whole south coast. So I just bring it up. I'm not going to dwell on it. There's a, sort of a real cursory overview of that for how it affects the Eel River that uh, many from the Eel River Watershed Association will have to listen to today. So if you're from Plymouth and you're interested in that, maybe grab one of those and, and, and stay tuned on that. So, and, and stay tuned to Watershed Action Alliance. Uh, we always use more involvement with that. It's um, it's a group of I think eleven uh, watershed associations, um, but we don't always have involvement from everybody, and it, it's kind of a small group that carries a big load. So, if you're interested in getting involved with that, let me know. Um, so, onto onto this workshop and um, and sort of the background of how it came to be. Um, Hillary Snook from EPA is going to be our speaker today, and um, I'll let Hillary talk about his program, but he puts on workshops like this for, for folks um, all the time, and a couple months ago we had one on the Cape at Barnes School, and a lot of us <coughs> happened to attend that, and Love was there, and Don was there, Did anybody else there at that one Barnes School, Jerry, Jerry and Derek were there, and um, really interesting, really, really useful information, but I think 
a lot of us who were there came away from it um, with a lot of new questions too, saying, you know, okay, that's that's great, we get this program and it makes a lot of sense, sounds like something we want to be involved in, but how specifically would we implement that in our in our watersheds? And so Don kind of reached out to me, a few people did, and, and I reached out to Hillary. And so the intent is to um, take this workshop today and um, and really get some hands-on learning about how to lose, learn the, use the tools, identify the problems, do the monitoring, um, ask some questions about how we would implement it in, in our own watersheds, our own water bodies, um, and really be able to step out of this and, and, and ramp up a program, to start a program. So um, the assumption, what I've told Hillary is the assumption is that this group here Of the general public. So I think everybody that's here is here because you already have an understanding of what cyanobacteria is, what the risks are, why we care about it, why we want to monitor it. So if that's if that's not the case and you need some more background, I'm sure you can ask questions and Hillary will be happy to answer them. And um, and, I'm, and I'm sure you can ask others in the group too as we get into kind of the hands-on phase here. So um, hope everyone's okay with that, but we're going to kind of jump into sort of the higher, higher level of this. So um, with that, we'll let Hillary get started. We're going to do, I think, um, some, some sort of intro here to the screen, and then we'll, he brought a bunch of the Cyanoscope uh, kits that we can get hands on with. So uh, Hillary Smith from EPA. Uh, thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Sorry I was late. Something about beautiful Boston traffic. Um, those of you that have seen this before, you guys are gluttons for punishment because this is the same talk as from Barnstable. Um, but, uh, anyway, hopefully, you'll still find it entertaining and, and informative. Um, as Alex mentioned, it sounds like you guys have a higher level of understanding about cyanobacteria. I have the same kind of 20 minute intro thing, which I can kind of gloss over unless you've got a lot of questions. I'll skim through that. Um, Based on the nature of the, of the group here, you may as well just keep really open and loose and interactive. So if I'm going through this and you have questions, just stop me and we'll discuss it right there on the spot instead of going back and flipping through slides and kind of forget if you're like me 10 minutes later, you forget what question you wanted to ask and then it's gone. So, uh, so if that works for everybody, we'll keep it that way. Uh, usually this course, usually what I do with larger groups is I do a demo, which means I kind of show people how the microscope works and software and go through it because it's really hard to get everybody behind the scope and be jumping back and forth. But I think today, this group, I think we could do that. I have about six scopes and stuff here, so we can set up. We've got plankton toes, we'll go out to the river, we'll collect some samples just for fun. How many people have collected plankton toes and stuff before? Everybody? Nobody? No, oh, couple, okay. All right, so we get to do that again. You can everybody hold up scorecards to see how you did. Um, as we go through. Um, so we'll try to do a lot of the hands-on stuff with the program, get you kind of comfortable with that um, as well. And then, um, usually, the, like you said, 20 minutes for this, and we can go into the first tier of the program, we take a break, and then come back, one more uh, slide stuff, and then maybe get the hands-on stuff, and then go from there. And I will stay as late as people want to stay here and work on the stuff, because my fate after this is heading back to Boston traffic. So, um, yeah, not something I'm looking forward to, but glad to be here. Uh, so this is a presentation of the Cyanobacteria Monitoring Collaborative. And you're all here because of these guys, the issues they pose. Uh, Cyanobacteria is becoming an ever-increasing problem. We're seeing it being more prevalent, but also um, I think people are becoming a lot more aware of what it is and the consequences from it. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm in the right place. This is Kingston, Mass. And it is a Cyanobacteria workshop. And it is June 12th. So we're doing well. Uh, at least I am. So for today, Oops, I already had it myself. Just a few minutes time about what cyanobacteria are, what's the problem. I know you guys are all probably pretty familiar with it, but they're nice slides anyway, so I'll go through them. Uh, and then basically get into the nuts and bolts of the CMC or the Cyanomarketing Collaborative Program. There's three different tiers, with levels, different levels of rigor, different levels of training, that sort of thing. But all pretty basic. We can take you all the way through the top end of the training in three, four hours, and you guys will be comfortable and ready to go and start monitoring. That's basically the agenda for this afternoon. Um, 
So, everybody knows what they are. They're prokaryotes. They don't have any cellular structure. They don't have organelles in the, in the cell walls. Uh, they used to be called green algae, mainly because of the way they function. They function like algae. They collect in sunlight, and that's what they use for their metabolic processes. Uh, but structurally, they're, they're like bacteria. So, there always was that misnomer, kind of like global warming, which has now changed the climate change. Uh, now they're actually, um, they don't call them blue-green algae anymore. In fact, if you do that, you usually get your hand slapped or something. Especially people like me, it slips every once in a while. Um, they obtain their energy through a photosynthetic process with particular um, molecules called fluorophores, they're proteins. And basically they have protein-based antenna within these structures which gather a certain wavelength of light, and use that for energy to function. And when they use that energy, they also give off energy at a different wavelength of light. So what happens is we can know what wavelength that these organisms absorb light and also what wavelength they expel energy as light and heat. And that's really important as you see later on in the talk. Um, and also, as you know, being uh, people working on lakes, and so they can um, regulate their buoyancy, which is a great tool for them because depending on the light conditions and conditions of other competing, uh, maybe green algae, they can regulate and out compete them just based on where they optimize their position within the water. Uh, and because they absorb a certain wavelength of light, they actually absorb the shorter wavelengths of light, which go deeper into the water column. So they can stay down lower in the, below the water surface and do a real good job and be very efficient at, at um, maintaining themselves. With me. Stuck on something here. Uh, let's try it again. Next. There we go. Okay. So, on the timeline of things, when they appeared three billion years ago, uh, the reason we know this, and those of you who saw my presentation, Kate, same slide, um, some marine formations called stromatolites right here. Basically, the ocean was full of CO2 at the time these things <coughs> arrived on the planet, and they used that as an energy source. Absorbed that, and one of their byproducts was oxygen. So, what happened when the oxygen was off gas from the organism, it actually took the iron that was in the marine environment to precipitate that out because we have iron, dissolved iron in the presence of oxygen, it will precipitate into the particulate form and settle out on the bottom. And that's basically what formed these, these marine formations. Um, they showed up a lot sooner than the dinosaurs did. Um, dinosaurs hung around for 180 million years, but sound bacteria had a much greater had started on strategizing ways to survive and exist in the environment. And then we're the newbies on the planet um, 200,000 years ago. So they've had a lot of time to build different strategies for survival. Um, this picture on the left is what we call our Dirty Dozen Key. It's an image-based key that was first developed by the University of New Hampshire and have since taken and enhanced it. And it basically shows the top 12 uh, genus level cyanobacteria in the New England region that are dominantly contain toxins or have the likelihood of containing toxins. Uh, if you look at the one in the upper left, uh, now called Delichospermum, which we call Anabina. George, you can correct me on any of this if, if I get it wrong because I I'm not like the name Anabina. Me too. So, but, uh, yeah, Delichospermum is just too hard to prove. It doesn't roll off the tongue. So there's different uh, physiological Characteristics of these different genera. This one here, the Anabina gets. All right, no worries. See, I'm going to be dangerous. In <laughs> like the kid in the story, you know, his parents. And his... So the large aconites, uh, those are resting cells that can rest for quite a while, or even seasonally, if the years in the bottom of a lake or water body, so conditions are right to propagate. Uh, and then the small heterocysts, which I didn't mention in the previous slide, I should have, are nitrogen fixing cells within the organism. So since our atmosphere is made up of 72% nitrogen, only 21% oxygen, these guys really optimize that uh, characteristic of our planet and really utilize it to the fullest extent. So um, the other thing they have, as I mentioned before, within the cellular uh, wall are these um, vacuoles, and these are what they use for uh, buoyancy, for regulating their buoyancy up and down. So when you get these blooms, a lot of times what you'll have is you have real calm surface conditions and overcast skies. So when the skies are overcast, 
These guys are kind of moving up in the water column to optimize gathering the most efficient light that they can. And then all of a sudden you have a couple of turbulent days and it mixes it up and then they can't adjust their buoyancy. So they have a real hard time adjusting right away and that's why you get these blooms. They all kind of stack up on the surface. They can't regulate themselves yet and then the wind comes and blows them up against the shore and you have your scums and stuff that are accumulating in particular of your water body. Um, they're found everywhere. Uh, the uh, desert storm is taking place. Uh, out in the east, the, uh, a lot of GIs came back with some symptoms uh, very similar to, well basically it was cyanobacteria poison they were getting because this cyanobacteria were actually in the desert sands. But when they got in the lungs and they got that moist environment, toxins were expressed and they got uh, pretty ill from that. So they exist in the very driest environments to alpine environments, to polar regions, thermal hot springs, sulfur hot springs, just anywhere you want to look for them, you're going to find them. It's just when they get overabundant that we really have an issue with them. Um, I like this particular slide in the lower right because it also shows that you know, they provide a lot of benefit to us. Uh, this is a desert environment and this purpley stuff is actually the mucilage from around the cyanobacteria and that's really breathe on the planet uh, as well. Okay. Everybody knows about the toxins. 60% um, of the cyanobacteria that we have contain toxins and they vary from the dermal toxicity, kind of like uh, the poison ivy, uh, similar. Uh, I've seen pictures of people with like second degree burns from the lumbia toxins, the dermal toxins, they're pretty nasty. Uh, neurotoxins were actually the, the forms of plaque on the neurons of the, of the brain. Neurons don't regenerate, so once that plaque builds up, the neurons die and you have symptoms like ALS uh, that occur. Uh, probably the biggest one that we worry about uh, is hepatotoxins, uh, and those are a liver toxin. Uh, there's been reports of dog deaths from ingestion to death of being under 20 minutes. So it can be a really acute uh, toxin. Um, we just actually got a, this morning, a uh, call from someone that had their dog in, in an Andover pond, and the dog had all kinds of neurological problems after just kind of playing around in the water. Uh, so toxicity can also be cumulative. In China, they found that a lot of people living around some of these really bad uh, water quality ponds have developed tumors that are, you know, the lakes are pre prevalent with cyanobacteria. So they may be getting it through inhalation by evaporation of some of these coming off the water or drinking the water. Mm -hmm. um, so effects can vary on your location to exposure and how you're exposed. You know, if you're tubing behind a boat, ingesting water that way, if you're a pet going out and eating all the gunky stuff off the shoreline, uh, that's going to be a different route of exposure versus pulling plants in your lakefront and all of a sudden ending up with big skin rashes from the, the benthic forms. Uh, so lots, lots of ways to, to be uh, exposed to it. And they also have a lot of taste and odor issues. And for public water supplies, that's a big issue uh, with them for aesthetics and drinking water and those uh, taste. So it can be very prevalent. Uh, just some examples here of some different conditions. Um, that doesn't look like my favorite swimming oh, beach. Oh, yeah. um, this is the red zone here. This is hypoxia taking place off the Louisiana coast from a lot of nutrients, not just cyanobacteria, but algae as well, coming in, dying off, settling on the bottom, and the bacteria is consuming those and depriving that base layer of oxygen. So it's a big dead zone. Nothing's going to grow there. You're not going to get any aquatic organisms or other plants growing in that area. And it just continues to spread as we use more nutrients and stuff in the environment that are affecting these, promoting these uh, algal growths. This is from um, a pond just east of Lake Champlain. Uh, I forget the name of the pond right now, but there you can't find a house around it. It's pristine. But around the turn of the century, it was off farmland, so there's nothing around it but sheep and cattle and dirt road. So those nutrients came into the system, they got locked in the system, and they've just been recycling year after year after year. Uh, beautiful place, but it's bright green. Uh, and everybody's heard of Lake Erie down in the Toledo area a couple years ago where they had the drinking water problem. They found toxins in the drinking water, shut down the drinking water supply for three, four days, and they had to bring in bottled water for a couple million people. Uh, that's actually what it takes to get Congress to move. That immediately produced $50 million to go to the Lake Erie Basin to do research and study. So, not that we wish that anywhere, but that just seems to be the way it works. Um, and this picture is Florida last year, uh, just downstream of Lake Okeechobee, where they were getting a big rainstorm came in. They opened up the floodgates to dewater the lake a little bit. So 
we went at flooding issues and it let out a huge slug of nutrients downstream and this is the results 24 hours after they did that. So it happens pretty quickly. So drivers of cyanobacteria blooms, I'd like to uh, just show you the different uh, possibilities that uh, cause it. This is actually uh, for the National uh, Climate Data Center. It shows the top 1% of intense rainstorms uh, over the turn of the century. So from the 1900s to now, you see that there's been a drastic increase in that top severe rainstorm events that have occurred. Uh, and if we look at the New England region, we've had a 71% change in that intensity. So now we don't get those small light rainstorms as much. We, now the 100 year storm we're seeing every 10 years or so. So the increasing frequency is much greater. And what that means for us is that if you have a pristine water body and you have no other inputs into the system, it's out in the middle of nowhere, just by the change in the climate alone, you're gonna have more nutrients washing off the landscape into this system. So basically you're gonna be having, uh, setting the stage for sooner than the normal uh, cyanobacteria blooms and, and problems with nutrients. This is a, a urban lake in Worcester, Mass, called Indian Lake. And another driver of cyanobacteria problems is what I like to call, I coined the phrase watershed dehydration. Uh, basically what that means is with all the intense infrastructure that you have now around a water body, rainfall, snow melt isn't going into the ground, cooling, getting filtered and cleaned, and then seeping into your, into your lake or your river. Instead, it's getting shot right in, it melts, gets the storm drains, it's shot right into the system and then it goes right out the outflow. So you don't have that nice cooling, long-term influx of flow moving into your system. It's in and it's out and it's gone. Um, so that's what I term watershed dehydration. Uh, I've seen some lakes in Massachusetts where um, evaporation is outstripping inflow to the water body. So it's just, and these are lakes that aren't having any outflow from an outlet. It's just their evaporation is taking place and you're not getting the inflow from the seepage to replace that uh, evaporation rate. Uh, the other is uh, a term I like to call ecological arrhythmia. Uh, a lot of states, a lot of programs use uh, winter drawdown as a way to promote uh, kind of uh, taking care of aquatic plant problems and issues which they have in their water body. But what I find in a lot of lakes, and I've seen this even in very rural lakes in northern Wisconsin where I grew up is that we're starting to see cyanobacteria blooms there too. And it's not all just related to climate change and, and warming temperatures. Um, what we've done is since the 30s is we've dammed all these water bodies up. We want, the, we want to go there in the summer. We want the lake, you know, walk out to our dock that day and see the water level at the same height that it's uh, all summer long. We don't want to see it drop like it would under natural uh, circumstances. So what happens is you've, pooled, you've raised the lake up on an unnatural pool level. Aquatic plants have a chance to grow in the summer, and then the winter you draw it down. Plants die, they desiccate. That works great for plant management. What happens to all the organic material? What happens to all the nutrients that are stored in those plants? They don't go out of the lake. They start to be sloughed off and move into the system. So over time, even in the more rural, pristine areas, you're getting this gradual increase of nutrient and organic material in your lake. So you're getting all of a sudden you're starting to see lakes stratify that didn't used to stratify before. You're seeing them warm up um, like they haven't done before. Um, and you basically turn the whole ecological process on its head. Of course, we want our lakes, we want to use our lakes like we want, uh, but at the same time, I think you really need to look hard at the balance between what you're doing to it ecologically and what you want for your, for your use. Mm -hmm. you know, it, yes? In that example, where you have an urban watershed that has quite a bit of black pavement uh, for a lake that's shallow. Yeah. So it's cyanobacteria are fueled by warming water. Yeah. You're going to find that the black pavement is going to heat up the water that goes into that system yeah. and exacerbate and fuel growth sooner than later because of the heating. Right. That's that's a, that's a great point. And yeah, they love cyanobacteria. Love that warmer water. And that, and so you got this perfect storm of. You know, the pavement, all the hot water coming shooting in the system, water not being able to move out and be replaced by the seepage coming in. It just kind of builds that scenario where you're going to have issues and problems. 
This is what I love to show just because it's so dramatic. Uh, you guys are familiar with this place, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So yeah. I probably know a lot more about it than I do. But just to uh, talk a little bit about all these things coming together, this is a great place. This uh, water body is 13 feet, I think, in, in total depth. I think the deepest spot, yeah. maybe 20. Yeah. Uh, two culverts, I believe, through this causeway that was man-made between these islands here. Flow comes in from east to west, as you know, and out the outlet. And we have one major agricultural operation there, the cranberry bogs, which that's one of my favorite fruits. <laughs> cranberries, but they use between 10 and 60 pounds of nitrogen-based fertilizer per acre per year on these on these crops. Mm -hmm. And then when they're done, after they harvest them out, of course, they dewater to manage their, their bogs. And when you add restrictions in flow, shallow lakes, warming bodies, and nutrients, just like in the Florida case, this is what you end up with. Um, many of you have probably seen this picture before. This is from 2015. Um, and apparently, I guess they a lot of the water from the east side, they drain off to go to the reservoir down. Um, yeah, so just to give you context for the group that you have here, we have people from, who work in, on the pond okay. there. And yeah, they divert uh, a few billion gallons of water per year out of that system into Silver Lake, which is the headwater of this river. Oh, okay. okay. So, um, you know, some of the questions that I think I'll have for you as we go on is, what what the tipping points are for these blooms. So if, you know, cyanobacteria, you've already said, are, are everywhere already, yeah. uh, just the nutrient loading and the warming of those components, is how much it takes to tip a lake. So if they're diverting this water into Silver Lake, which hasn't had a cyanobacteria major problem, um, what the tipping point will be for, for Silver Lake. Good question. Uh, one of the ideas behind this program is we knew when we first started that we weren't going to be able to solve everybody's problems and we couldn't be everywhere all the time. So what we wanted to do is give people the tools to, you know, we work with you, of course, but to kind of figure out those questions. So actually monitoring at the right frequency, at the right depths, in the right places, so you can start to build the data to kind of see what the behavioral characteristics of your individual water body is or are, and then work from there. Uh, work from not only when you might be able to predict a bloom to occur under these particular scenarios, but also maybe when toxins on those particular cyanobacteria are going to be expressed. Uh, some folks that are doing research in uh, Ohio said that one lake there, the Lake Harsha, I think it is, that they've studied a lot, and they can pinpoint it to the week based on their water chemistry when they're going to start seeing toxins produced. So these are tools that Hopefully we, we're continuing to develop, but we're developing now so we can put them in your hands so you guys can do the work and kind of start looking at, at how these scenarios are going to play out. So, yes. Is there no water exchange between those two? That one is so? The, I think... The, I, there's a small culvert right where that little shadow is right down there. Mm -hmm. And a tiny shadow, you see the culvert, yeah. you can see it in the little bit. Oh. That's the, there's only one. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's only one. Yeah, yeah, that's the only one. Oh, I thought there's one on the yeah, other side. And that's, yeah. and that's not a shadow, though. That's that's the East Lake cleaner blue water going through the culvert right. coming into the green. Yeah. <laughs> so with the, the <laughs> dam up at Stop Lake, um, when the diversions are not happening, it's pretty stagnant. The natural flow would be east to west. But then later on in the fall and winter, when the diversions are happening, it's both ponds. It's not just the east pond. Uh -huh. And at least we have a new protocol in place now where um, when there's a bloom going on, they don't d divert. Whereas there were some times in the past where airplanes could take other pictures showing the green stripe being going the other into way. the east pond. Yeah. Yes. Well, if you have any access to those pictures, you can see that. Yeah, it's, I, I find it to be a really interesting yeah. uh, and a great example of the show book. They use it all the time. It's very much like the, the how many of you are familiar with the Canadian Experimental Lakes project that took place back in I think it was the 70s and early 80s, where they actually dosed, they put barriers across lakes and they dosed it with high phosphorus levels, and they saw this exact same scenario that took place there. It was yeah. pretty interesting. Well, the lakes were set aside. There's so many lakes in Canada. They set it aside specifically for lake research and experimentation. Um, 
Then they did away with the program. Yes? I'm hard of hearing, and most of the time your voice is just fine, but if you could drink water and make the end of your sentences okay. louder, that <laughs> would right. be just great. I can, sure. I, I could refill anything. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. I think you're right under the fan, too. I don't know if that matters. but No, no. Just, it's just me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll try to talk later, louder, and you guys can just you know, plug Thank your ears in front or something. Else. Okay. So why the need for this program? Um, first of all, about five, six years ago, the state started calling us. Like I said, um, Connecticut was the first. Uh, New Hampshire called us. Uh, a few other states. It's a, we're getting all these calls from the public about these blooms starting to show up and uh, how do we deal with it because we didn't really have a strategy at that point. So I thought, well, why don't we get everybody together and just sit down in a room and talk it out and see what might be the best strategy. And we didn't limit it to just state water quality folks. We included university researchers. We included all the state water quality folks that wanted to be involved, lake associations, people like yourselves that are interested in your particular water body. And we all just sat around and started talking about this. And uh, the things that we realized early on is that it really is a moving target. You guys are talking about how to strategize for, for sampling in your lake and your water body. This is a great heat map showing cells and microsystem levels uh, in a particular water body. And this is translated from fluorescence values. But just to give you a comparison, um, this is in a particular lake at a particular time. And this is on a horizontal basis. The same thing can change on a vertical basis in your lake too, as far as the, the variability within the system itself. So if you're a board of health person and you're cell limit for determining if there's an advisory post be posted is 70,000 cells per milliliter, you've got a variation from 750 to 415,000. So depending on where you go and collect your sample, it's going to make a huge difference on the perceived risk of that particular water body. So more health people, um, correct me if I'm wrong, George, but I think in Massachusetts, from what I've heard, they just go to the public boat landings and they collect a sample in knee-deep water. Well, if your public boat launch is here, might not give you a very, indication, very good indication. If your beach is over here and that's where most of the public is, you've got a much higher risk associated with that than the Pardon? DPH likes to have a sample at a beach. Yeah, they have a the beach too? Yeah, they have it at the beach too? I know a few years ago they just went to the boat launches and just grabbed samples all around. That's easy. That's right. Right. Yeah. So this is where you guys come in. If you're very concerned and interested in your water body, uh, the protocol calls for collecting one sample from the deep hole states right here in your lake. So that's fine. It gives you some information. But if you really want to understand your lake, and maybe you guys already know, if you have cyanobacteria blooms occurring, where they're stacking up on what shore, what's going on. So we say one, of course, you have to have a sample. But if you want to collect 10 samples a day, it doesn't matter to us. You can collect as many as you want. And the more you collect, the more you're going to learn about what your water body is doing and how it's behaving. So I just like to use that example to. Question: Do the, do those yeah. hot spots move, or are they pretty much stay the same through the season? Well, they there can be a consistent pattern. If you say this is a, say the wind predominantly comes out of out of southeast for this example here, um, it can easily stack some bacteria up in a bay or something on a pretty regular basis. Uh, but uh, often these times, uh, these things will dissipate back in the water column as the heat of the day comes up and starts getting brighter. Uh, they can shift around depending on wind patterns. Uh, they, can, they can be all over. And that was one of the problems with, which is one of the reasons we started the first phase of our program, which I'll get into in a minute, called Bloom Watch, is because state agencies were getting all these calls. Oh, you've got to come out and look at, my, look at our lake. We've got this green paint out in front of my dock. Well, by the time they get out there, the wind would have shifted. It would have dissipated across the lake or it would have subsided back in the water column. And, and they couldn't tell what kind of problem there was there, what the risk was. So as you see with Bloom Watch, that kind of helps attack that issue a little bit. But um, the more you learn about your lake, the more you monitor it, the more you're going to understand these kind of characteristics which take place. The, the shallower the lake, the more prone it's going to be because during wind events, which we are experiencing with these wind, uh, with these storm events, what, what the wind does, it stirs the entire water column and it resuspends these nutrients back into the water column to the extent where the, those nutrients are pretty much evenly dispersed throughout the lake, which I would argue is what, we're, what we've been seeing in West Long Plaza. So when yeah. you get a count, it's fairly uniform throughout that lake, even though 
there may be some hot spots. Yeah. Good point. If you have a shallow lake that gets a lot of wind, it can be well mixed. Right. And, and you get that. But as you monitor, you'll learn those characteristics about your water body, too. Uh, okay, so we realized from the get go that it was a moving target. Just an example, like this heat map here. Uh, a lot of lack of local knowledge about the uh, public and animal health risks from these cyanobacteria. too. 60% contain toxins. Just because you have a bloom doesn't mean the toxins are going to be there. Uh, but if you don't have a bloom, the toxins can still be there. They can be dissipated in a dissolved form in the water column. You don't really know. No. So, you know, often everybody here has probably seen people out tubing and stuff and the water looks like pea soup and everybody's got their dogs in and they're swimming. You just don't know what the level of risk is. So this program helps to hopefully build that understanding. And we also realized early on that there's really a lack of overall data. Uh, as far as the risk and vulnerability to folks on these water bodies, uh, the toxins associated with different genera. So we don't even know in a lot of these water bodies what uh, genre of cyanobacteria exist in them. I mean, we know Annie, Fanny, and Mike, if you guys are familiar with that, um, exist in, in a lot of them, especially associated with blooms. But we really want to get a better understanding across the region of where these are existing. There's some species that are, that are making a, a move northward from more, uh, uh, not equatorial climes, but more warmer climates that seem to be moving further north. That might be a signal of some of the climate issues we're facing as well. Um, on that. And then we also wanted to tackle uh, potential for management applications. Could we develop some predictive tools and ways that people could strategize for managing some of these? So the program conception. State requests, which I talked about, open collaborative approach. And then we want to catch kind of the in-between. We've got a lot of research going on with satellite imagery, some real great remote sensing work that's being done, and developing algorithms for predicting blooms. But satellites are pretty high up. They're, sometimes lakes are obscured by cloud cover, so you're missing those days that it passes over, so you don't get that information. There's a lot of atmospheric changes that are going on, so you can't you have to take into consideration all those. So there's a fair amount of error involved in that end. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have a lot of genetic work going on. Work going on looking at cyanobacteria, looking at the gene sequencing, to determine what strains of cyanobacteria might express certain types of toxins. Uh, so that's going on that spectrum. And then our primary focus is everything in between. Folks like you that are interested in your water body, academic researchers, try to get a collaborative group together that can work on the in-between stuff. Uh, so that's the niche we we're trying to fill. We also want to be educational. We just didn't want to be researchy and data collection. I think the more people know about something, uh, the better off they are. <clears throat> uh, had to be inexpensive. If people are going to uh, jump on board and they want to participate and purchase the kits that we have and stuff. Uh, we can't afford you know, a couple million dollar satellite. Most lake associations, I don't think, can afford that. But if you can, come see me. <laughs> yeah. uh, informative, we want to be able to collect good, solid data. Uh, and we also want it to be scalable. So what we want is, if you're collecting data at your particular lake and water body, we want that data be, to be able to not only be used for what you want at your lake level, but we want to be able to take that and expand it up to maybe the state level or up to a regional level. We can aggregate that data and look at, OK, we have blooms that occurred in, in late June in this particular water body, where else in the region did we have blooms occurring? Is it a climate factor? Is it a factor due to uh, maybe land use in a particular region, like the potato farms up in north central Maine, where they have issues? Um, all that data, when we accumulate it up, we can answer different questions. And it provides extra benefit to the, to the, to the larger pool. Um, so the three tiers that we have are bloom watch, cyanoscope, and cyano monitoring. And based on, like I just mentioned, educational, data information, expense, uh, we've broken out in these three different distinct program parts. Bloom watch is primarily educational and informative, but it does provide data as well. It's very useful. Cyanoscope is these kits right here, which I'll show you in a minute, that we've developed um, for you getting your hands out in the water and finding out what's in your water body. And then the cyanide monitoring is when you want to get down to the nitty gritty, like Alex said, kind of start to determine, you know, to predict where to monitor and how to monitor what your lake's doing, and really understanding the dynamics of what's going on. Um, 
Data information goes up uh, as you go to these different tiers. Costs go up, and by costs, we're talking about uh, for the cyanide monitoring component, it's about $675 to invest in this kit. Um, so that includes everything except the fluorometer, which I'll show you guys in a minute, which is in here. Uh, and that's what measures your different wavelengths of light. That's a $1,500, $2,500 instrument. And what we've done with that is we have a lot of them that we have distributed around the region, and then we have folks bring their samples in, they analyze them at these different hubs. So we have, uh, well, they're all around, around the state and across the country now, but people have been able, like states that have volunteer monitoring programs, they collect all the volunteer monitoring, the volunteers collect the water samples, they bring them in and then the state goes ahead and anal analyzes them for you. Uh, so depending on where you live and in which state. Uh, training and expertise, like I said, um, really by the end of today, three, four hours, you guys will be able to go out and do this no, no problem and get off and running with it. Uh, so that's about the top level of training that you need. Um, the big thing is the quality assurance. Uh, if you don't have, if you're not collecting your samples in the right way and you're not doing it in the right format, uh, the data is not going to be useful to you and it's not going to be useful to anybody else. So really emphasize good, solid quality assurance when you do that. We have developed uh, something called a quap. Everybody know what a quap is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of people <laughs> nod their head dismally. <laughs> um, but we have one for this program. So if you decide to adopt it and you're looking to get state funds or something or grant money, you can just go and grab this quap, you adopt the program, and just pull it in and use it. So that's a big plus. Yay! That's one of the reasons we did it. Uh, so if you, and I'll show you our web page. A little bit, but you go to that and the quap is there, you can just download it and it'll give you all the nuts and bolts and nitty gritty details of the program in the different stages. Okay. How's everybody doing so far? Good. Nobody good. bored? I don't see anybody nodding off, so that's good. Uh, all right, so I'll talk about BloomWatch first. Uh, the reason we established BloomWatch was very simple, just to establish the spatial and temporal patterns of probable bloom occurrences in the region. We really didn't have a good idea where the blooms are happening. We still don't. We still don't know where they're occurring. I mean, usually people don't report them unless they have a problem with their dog or there's a foul odor, odor or something coming up from, from the lake. So we really wanted to get an idea to see if we could tease out different patterns of when these are occurring or are they happening every year in certain lakes, those sorts of things. And you can use it within your own water body. If you're collecting and you live on a water body, and you, you know, by collecting through Bloom Watch, you'll know it collects in this cove every year at this time or every, every month. So it's a really good tool for you yourselves, not only for the bigger picture. It's bare bones. The only tool you need is your smartphone. Uh, we have an app that we've developed. It took us two years to develop. We developed it one year. It kind of went through a beta phase. We did some tweaks to it. And last August was when we finally got it out there. And it is called Bloomwatch. Uh, it's bare bones. All you need is the Download it from the App Store. If you go to our webpage, which I'll have the link to at the end of this, um, just download it onto your phone and please use it. This is the only way we get the information. We can't be everywhere across the country documenting where blooms are because we just don't have the resources. We don't even know if EPA will be around in a year or two. Um, so, by all means, if you can, please try to collect that data and use the app. Probably won't be using it every day, but if you take a trip up to Maine or you take a trip to Florida or something, you see a bloom, just go ahead and record it. And we had uh, someone record something from Guatemala the other day that popped up. It's kind of nice. At least we, you know, we're not the only ones that have problems. So. Uh, it's all crowdsourced information. It goes to a public uh, website, public-based website. So as soon as you put your information in there, and I'll show you what that is in a minute, you can go to that web page and you can see it's already been posted there for anybody that wants to look at it can look at it. All right? Uh, and in this particular software, you can, if you have a association lakes, like all you folks partner together, you want to look at your lakes in the region, you can aggregate that data just for your locale. So you can form like a group and collect data and information that you want. And there's statistical programs, just simple plotting charts and pie charts and histograms, stuff like that you can use if you want to have a higher level of information. Um, so here's the web page. It's called cyanos.org, and I'll show that at the very end. Uh, this is where you can download the Bloomwatch app. It tells you all about it. project overview, how it works, data results, ways to get more involved. This is the bare bones. Just have a cell phone, smartphone, and the app. You know, so. um, 
What the app does is there's four screens to it. It's really simple. It doesn't take you long to take a picture and document a bloom. It starts out with an introduction basic page. These are just the... Um, is this the pointer? No, I'll, just, I'll, just, I'll just point. So from left to right, these are the, the different screens that you have that will show up on your phone. Does anybody have that loaded on their phone, just out of curiosity? Uh, yeah, do. Alex does? Okay. Yeah, I do. You do? Okay. Oh. Yeah, sure, why not? Is that a nice piece of oak there? Um, yeah, so an introduction and basic info page tells you who we are, what we're about, what the app's about, how to use it. The second uh, screen is lake conditions and bloom size. And that's an important page. It, um, it tells, gives you a lot of subtle information about the lake, which helps to document if it is, in fact, a bloom occurring or not. So you put down your name, you put down an alias. You have to put your email address in there so that stuff can get um, sent up and we'll get you on the, on the app. It's only, it's, it's not sent out to the public, so you don't have to worry about clicking on that and getting thousands of emails uh, from solicitors or anything. Uh, and then it asks you for simple drop downs, today's date, lake name, uh, location. You click a thing that says get coordinates, and it will grab the coordinates from where you are. So if you're standing on the water body on the edge of the lake, you see a bloom, you get coordinates, it'll take the coordinates from where you are with your cell phone, uh, GPS system. And then you take three different photos. We want a lake-wide photo. Well, let me back up a minute. Lake conditions and size. A couple of things we ask for is, what's the weather conditions? Is it calm and overcast? Is it blue sky? That's important information, like I mentioned earlier. If it's overcast skies, mm -hmm. well, that kind of led some credibility to it possibly being a blue. Uh, what are the surface conditions? Is it flat, calm? Is it choppy and rough out? Just simple information like that, which helps. Uh, and then the photos, there's three photos we ask for. One is kind of lake wide, so you get a little picture of the sky to kind of verify that it is indeed overcast. Um, lake conditions. Uh, the second is along the shoreline, so you can see if the bloom was stacked up along the shoreline or not. And then the third one is actually kind of a macro shot, as close as you can get to, to that to help identify it. And then once you have those collected and you've got your coordinates, you actually just hit submit and submit the data. And what happens is that data goes up into a crowdsourced database called sitsci.org, and I'll show you a couple of slides of it real quickly. And your images hopefully will look something like this. Upper left-hand side, kind of nice lake-wide picture, shows you that the bloom is distributed throughout the lake. Center one, uh, that's a, just stacked up along the shoreline, so it's very localized. And then a couple other, um, almost a macro picture on the right here. And then the one that's center I put in, um, everybody knows what that is? Anybody know what that is? Um, that's a pollen bloom. Yeah. So it's a good example, where, and this is often mistaken for a bloom. It happens this time of year, and I have a sample of some pollen you guys can look at under the microscope. It's kind of fun, so you'll be able to tell real quickly. But it's not cyanobacteria. Okay. This is a crowdsourced database, sitsci.org. You go there, you log in. I think you need to get a, a, a passcode for it or just register, and then you're all set, and then you get into the BloomWatch app. And loads everything in, so your images are here with the lot longs and the date you took it. And then you also have geo-referenced information. So as you can see, New England here is not case okay since August. We've got a little bit going on. We have some in California. I actually talked to someone the other day. I think I put that slide in here. Uh, they've been going gangbusters with our Bloomwatch app. Uh, but they haven't submitted the data to us yet. So we're working on that. Um, how's my voice doing? OK? Yeah. So this is California using the app. So they've, they've actually implemented into their state water quality program. They've distributed these kits to every single regional office, and they're using the Bloom Watch prolifically, and they're just populating this like crazy, and they're having lots of blooms already this year. So it can be a really useful tool to find out where the hot spots are and what's going on in the system. You know, is it increasing, not increasing? Well, lots of useful information there. So on that last map, there were different colored dots. Did that signify something? It does. I think it's, um, I don't know if it's the date that they collected. I'd have to go back and look at it. I just talked to them the other day, just posted it. But yeah, it, it does have, I don't know if it's you know been there for a couple of weeks and it gets darker, if they take it repetitively or not. 
Right. Any questions on Bloom Watch? Okay. It'd be great if you guys can use it. Uh, we actually have a. Uh, I had a meeting this morning with a Coast Guard auxiliary. They're going to get involved and start adopting this program as well. So okay. they're going to be out, not only along the coast but in freshwater bodies as well around the country. So it's kind of exciting. Uh, so it's kind of taken off. Just fun. Um, cyanoscope is the next level, and that. Uh, we're going to talk about the cyanoscope kit here. So, so actually, we can turn on the lights for a minute. I'll just um, show you the kit. We can do a little show and tell here. Uh, everybody see this okay still? Do? Very well? Okay. The reason we developed a kit is, again, for a lot of educational purpose, so people can really understand what are cyanobacteria, what they look like, are they potentially toxic, um, and have the tools to get out and really monitor the water body and really understand it. That data also is it's aggregated up into the public crowdsource database. Then we're starting to get a picture across the region of what is where. You know, where are there hot spots for a particular genre of cyanobacteria that are known to produce specific toxins? So it helps us build that informational database. We relied on it ourselves. George, how many people in the state of Mass work directly on HAPS for your agency? <laughs> How many people in your state, in the state of Mass, work directly on harmful algal bloom sound of bacteria? Me and uh, the consultant. And Joni Viscanis. Okay. So you got maybe four people in the whole entire state. It's not likely George and Joni and the consultants are going to be able to get everywhere at any time and really get a good understanding of this. So that's where you folks come in and provide a lot of value not only to your own water body, but also to the aggregated data for everyone else. I would argue that we have many more ponds than we give credit. But not. We have shallow lakes that are prone, shallow lakes that don't have a long residence time because they were adopted. If they have a significant amount of shoreline runoff that they get, if there are, there are agricultural activities nearby, they all contribute. And the closer you get to an urban area where you have shallow lakes that heat up because of pavement and stormwater runoff, the greater the likelihood you're going to have a cyanobacteria. So I would say there's a lot of it that we haven't even begun to document, and that's why this program is so important. You know, and, and the work that you guys do when you do implement this, it, it gets noticed. It goes up to another level, and like the issue in Toledo, if there isn't something to shake people up, you know, I say that as a Fed, you know, but usually that's what it takes. You've got to get noticed, and this is one way to do it, and, and raise the awareness so that people start to take action, start doing something about it. Well, it affects property values, that's the good also. Yeah. Big Huge. So, so this is the, uh, I'm just going to do a little Vanna White routine here. Uh, this is our sound monitoring kit. Again, we put it together. It was fun. Some of the people in our work group, one woman has a small business operation. She said, oh, I'll do it, no problem. You know, because she's developed some of the parts in here uh, by herself. She said, oh, yeah, I'll put it together. Well, she uh, partnered up with Opportunity Works out of Lawrence, Mass., which is a handicap group. So this is all put together by Opportunity Works in Lawrence, Mass., which is fun. So we're helping employ people. Um, and it's really taken off. We, we, like I said, uh, California bought 13, 14 kits just last fall, and we're really going gangbusters with it. And it's, it's all across the country. Um, lots of things in the kit. One thing that you won't see in the kit, unfortunately, well, not yet, is this plush stuffed toy. This is an anatomically correct anabainite, or religious <laughs> sperm, <laughs> with the achene and everything. Um, the only thing is, is it's not life-size, thank God. Uh, but you can even get these that are like this big. Huge. You can use them as a neck pillow, I guess. Um, so it's kind of fun. I just show it for demos. We have even middle school kids that are participating in this program and doing a great job. So this is my first hands-on kind of prop to pass from the book. <laughs> and the tag's on it, so if you want to order a dozen for yourself and family and friends, you know, there's the, the website. <laughs> So as the kit shows here, for those of you guys, hopefully everybody can see it. Uh, just general overview, then I'll pass some of this stuff around so everybody gets to touch it and handle it a little bit. Comes with a carrying case, there's a zooplankton net. Uh, 
I know probably a bunch of you have done zooplankton tows before. This is a 50 micron net, small size, very portable. Right? This particular part of the program, we don't care when or how many times you collect these samples because you're the ones that are going to be looking at them under the microscope. The more frequently you do it, because species can change through the course of the season, usually do, the more information, the more you're going to learn from your lake. Right? Um, you can collect it from shore, you can collect it from the deep hole if you're out in boat or wherever you want. Really. You're just looking to find out what's in your system. All right. um, so we'll go out and actually can demo that right off the pier in, in a bit. Okay, so I'll just pass that around. I'm also going to talk about the, um, mm. the cyanide monitoring component now as well, which is the final tier where you're collecting samples. I'll talk about it briefly, go into a little more detail in a minute. But this is the tool that you use for that. Uh, how many people have collected integrated tube samples in their water body? Anybody here? Alex? Okay. Uh, so basically what you're doing with this, and we'll, we can demo this out, I think. Can we do that on the water there too? Is the tide still coming up? We're probably we six or seven feet right there at the back. Oh, okay, perfect. So you hold on the line at this end. This drops down through the water column, down to a depth. If you're in a lake and you're collecting it in the deep hole, down three meters. And the reason you go three meters in depth is because from the surface is you're collecting what we call the photic zone, that area where most light is going to penetrate down through. That's where you're most likely to find the cyanobacteria to be um, present. Um, they do go much deeper than that, of course, but we need to find a baseline to work from because we couldn't have everybody collecting them at one foot and 20 feet and everything else. So this is the consistent baseline. Uh, if you want to collect samples from deeper depths, you can do that. We have water suppliers that are collecting down around where the water intake takes are, which might be 30 feet or so in depth, and there are blooms that will occur underneath the water that don't always occur at the surface, depending on the species that's there. So, so this is just what we call an IT, or an integrated tube. Um, comes with a kit. As you can tell, it's very expensive, high-tech, sophisticated equipment. Um, probably cost you about six bucks at your hardware store. So we keep the costs at that. So, and they're marked for the meter depth. Yes. Question about the plankton. Uh, yep. Is that for qualitative versus quantitative, or? It's all qualitative. Yep. Okay. Thank yep. you. Sure. Okay. Another thing you have in this kit is the student microscope. This was a great find. We started out with three different types of microscopes in this program. First, start out with. Uh, the lens from a, a laser pointer that was taken out and glued onto a plexiglass, a piece of plexiglass, and then put on a couple eye bolts with some threaded, threaded rod, and it worked great. Uh, you put your cell phone over the top of it, and then you just thread it up. That was about six bucks at the hardware store. We thought we might be able to afford something a little better than that. Um, so the next step up, we bought a, a tool called the Hookups, which is basically just a clip, which clips onto the ocular of your microscope, and then you snap your cell phone in there and it'd look through there and you'd take the picture. That tool was about $75 and we bought a bunch of them. And then some folks found this, which is a student microscope. It's battery operated, it has three different objectives. Um, so it's backlit here, you can put it on a picnic bench because it's got batteries, you don't even have to plug it in anywhere. Uh, we added a mechanical stage and we added some digital optics, which you see here. So you can plug it right into your smartphone, your tablet, or your computer to collect images. And this cost us about a hundred bucks, so not a not a bad price. So this is this is what's included in our. Uh, so I'll just pass that around. And to accompany that, uh, we're putting together what we call the Dirty Dozen Key. This is online. It's an image-based key. So for those of you that are biologists and have been used to going through dichotomous keys and looking at physiological characteristics by looking at text and drawings, we've made it a little simpler. All you have now is just basically an image. And if you click on that image, what it's going to do is it's going to give you a bunch of similar images of that particular genre of cyanobacteria. So you can just click through this, look through your microscope, look through the key that's on your tablet or your computer, and start kind of narrowing down what you, what you think you have in your water bottle. So I'm just going to pass these around for folks to look at, and too. And those laminated ones are included with it, so you can just take them with you rather than... We're doing, we're, yes, but we're trying to do a better version. Right now, we don't have them in all the kits. Like if you purchased a kit, it probably wouldn't be in there. You'd have to go off the online key. It's on the web page. Okay. Uh, but we're developing a, a small binder 
one that will also have toxicity listed, any synonymous names that might be called, like anabena slash delichospermum, uh, toxicity, potential toxicity, and a little bit of habitat characteristics. So that's a work in it's progress right much now. Much easier to look at if it's a sunny, you know, or sometimes it's hard to see your right. screen. Right. Yes. <coughs> Just a quick housekeeping uh, issue or question. Your PC tubing with the blood nuts on it? Yep. Uh, in essence, you just drop it when you put your thumb on the top? Or? I didn't explain that very well, did I? Good. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, basically you drop it down, it goes straight down. We call it a core tube because it's taking a core of that water column straight down. Because plankton and uh, cyanobacteria, they can be very dispersed, you know, like clouds, different layers in the water column. And you want to capture that all. Plus, depending on what time of day you go out there, if it's early morning, they're probably going to be up close to the surface often uh, because they're gathering that that light, but when it gets real bright, they kind of subside because the light can be damaging to them as well. So they'll move back down the water column. By doing that integrated tube, you've captured all of that. Through that. So you go down, and, and I just learned this last year, we used to just bend over the hose and bring it up with the cord and then pour in your sample, which you guys would be able to try. But one of the young ladies last said, oh, just, just put your thumb over, it works much better. And by golly, it worked great. So you just put your thumb on it, it locks it in tight, and you just bring it up, you got a really nice, good sample. So you're not you're not trying to empty it like one foot at a time or something. You you just dump the whole thing. Yep. And those actually you use a I guess this kid I don't have everything in. But we have some Boston Brown bottles like this, a little, little larger and so mm -hmm. it comes with a kit. So when you take that, the whole thing will fit in that one jar and you're all set. There's your sample, you're good to go. If you want to take multiple mm -hmm. um, tubes you can. Yeah. So, here's the kit. This is just a supply kit that comes with it. It's got microscope slides, cover slips, pipettes, that sort of thing with it. So that's another part of the kit. Can I ask you how long this sample is good for and how it degrades over time? Or yep. Or is it yep. The, um, actually, now's a good time to see where I'm at on this. Okay. Um, everybody see that okay? Enough? Okay, so maybe we can put the light off again. All right. So this is kind of the steps in the cyanoscope process. You start, you go out there, you collect a sample. You, you don't have to do it by putting on waders and waiting out. If you can do it off the dock, like here, that's fine. Um, you can toss it out from shore. You go out in the boat. doesn't really matter. It's collected. It's brought to shore. It's put into one of those brown bottles. And then you transfer it into this little gizmo, which is called a zapper, that one of the people from a work group kind of invented. It's just, you just open it up at the top like this, pour in your sample, close the lid, and you just clip it on the side of your bag for about half an hour. And what happens is the, the buoyancy and the respiration that's happening in the cyanobacteria, they're all going to float to the top of this little tube here. All the algae, all the zooplankton, all the detritus that might be floating around in your sample, is going to all go to the bottom. And this is an example that shows, these are all the zooplankton that are, the, that are light lovers. So they all move into the clear part of the, of the zap. So what that does is after half an hour, you unscrew the cap and very carefully draw off your sample off the top. And you've got a really nice, clean sample of cyanobacteria to put under the microscope. Yeah, and I wonder if I... And if there's nothing there, there's no cyanobacteria after a half oh, an hour? Small. Or a very small amount? Yes. Yeah, but it should be aggregated up, up here in the surface. This is this just got bumped. If you bump it while you're taking it, they're going to get knocked down. But because they're buoyancy, they will float back up. So, great little tool. Right. Question about seasonality. Do you do this just when you see blooms, or can you do it during school season in April? You can do this through the ice in the wintertime if you want. Yep, for this part of it. Uh, and for the monitoring, we don't mind. If you want to do it year-round, you can. Uh, but what... The cyanomonitoring component, there is a temporal part there. We want you to collect at least every other week. Uh, that's the only way you're going to get the dynamics understood uh, and how your lake is progressing. I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, but for the plankton toes, anytime you want. Yeah, It's a great teaching tool. We do have some classrooms using it. Yes? Is, is there a temperature component that the uh, cyanomonitoring uh, is supported in as opposed to if it gets you know, below a certain temperature, it's not you know, supported? Well, they exist everywhere, you know, hot springs to Arctic environments. 
But like George said, what really kicks them off, and you see that especially around here, is the heat. And once your lake stratifies, it starts to warm up. You're getting that thermal load from rainstorms coming in. So they really outcompete the green algae and other stuff that might be in your water system. So that's when they take off. Many of our shallow lakes do not satisfy. They just get hot. <laughs> they just go. Because of the mixing that occurs during storm events, yeah. they're shallow. Yeah. yeah. The deep hole is stratified, but that's probably about it. Yeah. But they're definitely warming. Yeah. yeah. So this is just another example, of sequentially, of how the older example used to work, where we had a pinch clip instead of that little tube on the bottom. We just draw it off. So this is the dirty dozen and the microscope hooked up to and so I'm spending time on that or that. Um, <clears throat> high naturalist, this is where cyanoscope is kept. We want you to keep, once you've collected those nice images on your microscope, we want those to be uploaded into a database that you can share with people. Um, so you go to iNaturalist, you, you log in uh, with your password that you make, and then you add your observations into this program, which is, this is a, uh, just to show you how an actualist works. But, uh, and you can then select where it is. You can either take the coordinates off your phone, where you, collect, where you collected the sample, or if you didn't get to do that, you just collect your plankton toe and you came back in the, to the shore or your house or wherever. You can just go to this map and you can type in your lake name in the state. It'll pop right to that lake and then you can drag this cursor around just like Google Earth or Google Maps to where you actually took the sample and that will record it for the database. And then you just add your photos. So you've had your photos that you've taken with the software, which I will have to show you probably when we're out there. You uh, make a file of your photos, and then you upload them right up into here, and that populates the project with images like this. So then you're starting to build an image library that everybody contributes to. And about once a month, we'll go in and we'll look at those images and we'll actually verify if they are what you said they were, or if you don't know, you just don't, you don't even have to put any, you don't have to identify them. You can just put them in there and we'll go in and we'll do the identification for you. Uh, George has been very helpful in doing this as well. We call it in our, our identathon. We get on the conference call and we all get online and we go through these and say, yep, that's what we think it is. And it goes from kind of just an image based um, insert to what we call a research grade image which means it's been confirmed by experts that it is indeed either what you said it is, or if you don't know what it is, we've just confirmed what it is. Uh, so it's going to show up like this, where you have your images up here, and then over here you're going to see where this one, uh, Crow Cognitive, has gone to a great image, which means it's been verified by more than one person. So it's a, you could say it's a consensus-based uh, agreement on how these are, are classified. And then you're starting to get a population map. We can eventually look at, OK, where are we finding this particular species across the country? That's what we would like to get to ultimately. Yes? Does your local organization get the feedback on, from the experts on what it is? What you, yeah, what we've tried to do, there's a common page here, too. So we'll, you can just go this, to this yourself. And then it will be verified, it will say, oh yeah, research grade, or maybe send an image that we can't look at and understand. Like this, we might know that's a, a pennate diatom, but you know, there's no way we can tell anything more than that by that image that's there. So we need good, clean images. But if they're there, we'll identify them, and you can go to that web page and look at them. You can do searches. You can say, okay, I'm looking for microcystis aruginosa. You know, where does it occur in the region, if you're interested in doing that? Or if you're interested just in your subset of lakes, or just like, where does it occur in Cape Cod? You know, or South Shore, you can do that. But as long as you get people participating and putting in the, the information. This one right here, this is the uh, this is the one from Lake Isabel, Guatemala, that was sent last week, a couple weeks ago. This is five really nice images, so it was easy for us to identify them, and put them up. So I just got a call two days ago from a French television station. They want to fly someone over here to interview me for the program, which is. I don't know how that happened. It's kind of exciting that it's getting this global notice. We've had people from South America and Ar well, Argentina and Brazil and Italy and Great Britain that have already kind of tried to coordinate and, 
and work on this project with us. So it's kind of getting outside the U.S. even. So we like to think we're doing something right. So the cyanide monitoring program, we'll just go through this quickly and then we can get some hands-on stuff going. Um, this is collecting integrated tube sample. You can see collected the sample. She's just collecting it in the larger uh, Boston Brown bottle there, which comes with your kit. So there is a, like I said, there's a temporal component because we really want to understand what's going on when in your lake. And I'll explain that to you in a minute. Uh, so we're tracking how it's changing. Um, so the commitment is the beginning of June through the end of September as a, as a minimum. If you guys want to put more than that, you can. If you want to put more than one sample every other week, you're welcome to do that as well. Uh, it's centralized data, which is on our webpage. And we're actually working on some of the data visual, visualization tools that go with it. Um, so this is just the beginning of June to when? End of September. End of. We do have blooms occurring even into October. Into um, summer. Huh? All the way to December. Well, yeah, we've seen them under the ice as well. So. In Halifax. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you're well aware of that, huh? Okay. Uh, just a pictogram, my great graphics here of, of collecting samples from either the deep hole at three meters, or if you're like a beach monitoring program or you don't have a boat, you can collect a one meter sample from the shoreline using the same tube. You just put on one meter. And the reason we did that is because we wanted to engage people like Boards of Health that are just waiting out, collecting it from the shore to boat launch, or a beach program. Most people that are going to be recreating are going to be recreating in that one meter depth of water. They're playing with the dogs and the kids swimming. So that's the zone that we wanted to capture with that. The only problem with that, though, is that when you're out at one meter, you're also resuspending uh, the Right. Which are not part of them. Right. Right. So what we've done is try to state that in the quap so that people are careful not to muck up the bottom. Yeah. You, know, you can only do so much. You know, yeah. you know, we try to set a baseline here. This is what we hope people do. We hope they follow the protocol so the data is collected well and we go from there. You know, but, uh, yeah, but you're right, George. Uh, so this is the fluorometer. And this is the, uh, the other tool that's $1,500, $2,500, depending on what you, one you buy. Uh, and what we're doing here is we're measuring two different pigments. Uh, we're measuring <clears throat> chlorophyll A and phycocyanin. Phycocyanin is a pigment that is almost exclusively found in cyanobacteria, but not entirely. And then chlorophyll, which is found in, in green plants. And basically what we're looking for is through the course of the summer season, usually your green algae will come out first and dominate. They like the cooler temperatures. And then as it starts to warm up, stuff later in the fall, around August or so, they'll start to drop and decline. Right? And that is about the time where the sound of bacteria really like to take off. Water's getting warmer. They can outcompete the green algae for light. And as the sunlight gets lower in the sky, and they usually take off. So what we're measuring is the ratio between the chlorophyll concentration and the phycocyanin concentration. As we see the chlorophyll going down, we start to see the cyano, phycocyanin go up. That's kind of our trigger point. We can start to be able to predict potentially when, if conditions are, when a bloom is going to occur. Hillary, is there something that we can do when we see this happening to prevent it from going all the way to the, uh, to the ultimate bad conclusion of the bloom? Well, there, there's several management applications you can use. Of course, some of our chemical treatments, uh, some ways, depending on how, what kind of system you have on how you can handle the hydrology to the extent that you can. Uh, it's difficult. It's difficult. Uh, is, there, is there some way to tell when they are actually releasing the toxins so that you cannot be alarmed if it's just... There's a lot of research going on that particular aspect right now. Okay. We still don't, at least to the best of my knowledge, George might know more than me on this, is that you can have a pretty clear or decent looking lake, but there can be toxins floating on a dissolved form there. You can also have what looks really nasty and the toxins won't be expressed. They're not sure what really triggers some of this toxin mm -hmm. expression and what doesn't. So it's tricky. But what we're hoping through this process is that as you start to learn your lake and dynamics, you reach a certain threshold where you start looking for toxins, 
maybe like the example I gave in Ohio, they know right when they're going to start seeing toxins expressed in the water body. So hopefully over time you will be able to see that. You know, it doesn't get rid of the problem, but at least it makes you more aware of how to warn people. Uh, is local conservation permission approval required before undertaking any sort of treatment? Probably, even dam manipulation and things like that would probably require yeah, something. Yeah, like that. requires a big permit. Right. Yeah, yeah that along with Department of Agriculture, I guess. Uh, oh, the Department like Natural Heritage get involved if they're endangered species. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it gets to be a big, big conundrum there with it. Uh, so, yeah, we don't really spend. On our webpage, we have some information on how to manage to the best we can, but uh, it's a big problem. It's it's tough a tough nut to crack. Any opinions forming on um, circulation um, devices such as the solar bee? Well, the solar bees work well in certain applications, certain size water bodies. They do okay, and, and that goes for I've seen some nice experiments done depending on the size of your water body. That's always the problem, and then lake depth and logistics of, like George says, wind conditions, mm -hmm. urban infrastructure. You know, there's a lot of drivers, a lot of factors. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes? You mentioned earlier that there were labs where you could take samples to, I can't remember for quite what purpose, to get them identified, or something, regional labs. Thank you. So are these available in regional labs? Um, we basically use these. And what we're doing is we're just tracking Right now, we're tracking just that change, what's present. But um, we do have a lot of the states have them as well, these ELISA um, tests, which for they test for the toxins. You know, they're, they're fairly decent, they're fairly accurate. Um, so you can have ELISA tests run. But what we're trying to do is, those get expensive and time consuming. Uh, so what we're trying to do is, by working with this kind of data and collecting it, Hopefully we can say, okay, now we're at a threshold where we expect to see something, you know, through our data collections in the past. Now we should start doing a lot of testing and spend the money on, on looking at it a little deeper. So the good thing about that instrument, the gallery is all the specific to identifying the levels of cyanobacteria. Why? Because it's a an instrument that measures a pigment that all cyanobacteria have. And so when it achieves a certain level, you can make an assumption that perhaps there are toxins associated with it. Uh, but when you use your microscope, you can also say, well, the majority of the algae that we see, excuse me, cyanobacteria, I still call them algae because of the pigments that they produce and the fact that they look more like algae than they do like bacteria. The fact is, if you you identify the taxon or the genus, you, you, you know what it is, and perhaps with that information, you know, have some sense of what toxins are being produced. Because uh, toxins are very specific to certain genera, like microcystis. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be looking for microcystin. And anabinas, we'll be looking for anatoxin, and so on. It's helpful to know what these things look like, so you get a sense of making that connection with the uh, information that that instrument is giving you about the levels of pigment. So what we do is we have people collect samples of their integrated tube. It goes in a little sample jar like this, and then we have you freeze it. And that preserves the, the pigments. And then in the fall and the winter, we can bring the mass, you know, we can analyze them as a group. Um, that what that does is allows us people like you to collect those samples and then we can look at them in mass when we have the time and go through them so you preserve the sample by freezing. Once it's thawed, it goes in a little cuvette like this. It's put in here, the lid closes, and then you can read the readings on the concentrations of cyanobacteria, uh, phycocyanin and chlorophyll. So you will analyze those samples for us if we send them to you in a freezer pack, or, or how does that work? Well, we're, we're networking with different groups and, and trying to get um, people involved that, that will do that. So yes, for Massachusetts, well, I don't know how constrained Joni is these days with stuff, or, or George. Um, there's some political things going on. <laughs> uh, but if they come into the lab, depending on how many, we'll analyze them in the fall for you. 
How do we keep them cold and transport? Just you just freeze them, freeze them solid, and put some ice blocks around them, and then okay. they come up to the lab. So I'm happy to talk so to you guys. You don't have more. to buy a fluorometer. You wouldn't have to. If you were a water supplier or you're really concerned, you could freeze them that morning, collect them, thaw them out, and you can read them that afternoon. You don't have to wait till fall. So if you're interested in tracking it as you went through the season, you could do that. And what is the meaning of the red pigment, the rhodamine, or how we pronounce it? Oh, ignore that. that that's, oh. a, that's a standard that we use for tracking the instrument itself. Oh, okay. So, yeah. but, yeah. but do all water suppliers or water treatment plants have those that capability? A lot of them have bought it. The equipment? At least equipment. in our program, a lot of people said, we'll just buy it. You know, it's 1500 bucks. That's not much money. You know, in fact, a lot of watershed associations said, yeah, you know, no problem. We'll just buy it. So. The, uh, so the first time they'll be testing for these toxins is uh, in the next, starting next fiscal year. Who? Who uh, they? The water suppliers. And so they they already have they already know which toxins to be testing for. So that's what they're going to be looking for. Like a so they'll either have a contract with somebody or they'll have the equipment to do it. And they will be taking samples for that sample to be sent to a contractor to tell them that there are toxins uh, present in the sample. I don't think they're prepared at this time with the expertise to identify what they are, although some, some of these suppliers are more sophisticated than others. And so, uh, yeah, I'm wonder, thinking of one in particular. I remember they're being asked to at least send a sample to have it tested. And that's after treatment. Hmm? You mean like a town, each individual town supplier? When you say a water supplier? Yes, a town water supplier. It would be the suppliers for the population greater than 50 bucks. Is that surface water only then, not groundwater? Surface water suppliers. Yeah. Surface water suppliers. So I want to bring this up so we have some hands on time. Otherwise, Alex is going to beat me up over here. <laughs> I want to spend more time hands on, so I got to with this. But uh, hopefully, some of this is at least new news to you. So, this is basically what I just talked about that change in transition between chlorophyll, phycosan taking off. This is that ratio of taking off. And we've seen that at least two to three weeks ahead of time before we see any change in second disc transparency of the water body. Um, and then, like I said, two to three weeks before bloom has occurred. So, it can be a real good indicator metric to use for, for forecasting what you have. Um, this is our database so far on the website where we've been, people have been collecting samples. We're working on this, it's a work in progress. Scatter plot, chlorophyll, phycocyanin concentrations um, in parts per billion. Um, okay. um, web page, and then just we do lots of hands on training, like you guys know already, just from this experience here. A little mobile lab we take around uh, to certain areas, which works well. Uh, that's our work group that comes all the time, dedicated group to kind of drive the program. And this is the website you want to go to for all the info. Uh, this is also a link for the UNH, University of New Hampshire, CyanoKey. That will be linked, that's on our web page too as well. So all that information you get there. If you want to sign up to our listserv, that's on the web page. You'll get notifications of any new updates that there might be. There's a small blog on there now. Um, it just kind of keeps you current with stuff. And that's pretty much it. So, Alex? What's the uh, prevalence and, and risk and harm of cyanobacteria in estuaries and, and marine waters? And is that something that is worth sampling also or not a concern? Certainly is. And I was thinking about that on the way down here. Uh, there is a program that NOAA does. It's called the Phytoplankton Monitoring Network, uh, which does a citizen-based thing, but it's more... I think they're more limited because uh, they're, they have to rely entirely on funding, where this we try to make it go out and train people and get them on the ground running, so it's a lot, much less expensive. But I thought maybe we can make that connection. If people want to collect out of estuaries and see what they have, send them in. Send those images. We certainly would do that, and maybe we can eventually find a partnership with, uh, with NOAA on that, too. Are there, are there talks informing species in there's a lot of toxin forming species. Um, Turinichi is a common species that um, That's the West. Not, not, I mean, cyanobacteria. Oh, cyanobacteria. Um, that's a good question. As far as on the on the 
Um, actually, you do find the marine waters off the coast of uh, North Carolina in the Moose River. That has cyan. That's a, that's an estuary. And they left it because of the pig farms down there. Adding so much phosphorus to that system where it became nitrogen limited. And as a consequence, the favor to grow the cyanobacteria. The Baltic Sea is another one that has a very extensive uh, amount of cyanobacteria. That ocean water is pretty much restricted because of the bottleneck with the North Sea. And the Danube and all these other rivers that have been dumping nutrients into the Baltic, it's finally resulted in, in, in blooms occurring frequently in the Baltic. So you can't find it under certain conditions. I mean, if you really like using the microscope, yeah. have at it, you know. <laughs> Might be something. I don't expect you know. to see anything around here. No. Yes. The largest pond in our system is nearly 400 acres. And we uh, would love to, to start sampling. We'd like to at least consider that. But are there any hints that you could give to reduce the amount of manpower spent as to look for more likely sites or how many sites, you know, the how often you've done. Uh, yeah. But how do we think it more? That's a lot of acres. Yeah. And I live next to a 300 acre lake. And uh, you, know, you collect out, you can collect from the deep hole. And then yeah. depending on what your uh, shoreline looks like, you hear a lot of bays or coves. Yep. Um, oh. Coves. You might want to target some of those coves, especially on the windward side, where you might have blooms that are going to be blown into those coves, okay. uh, or nutrients from circulation and stuff. So that, I would focus there to start. How about uh, places that are uh, mostly are, are used extensively for swimming? By there, you're residents. there. You're adding in the component of risk. So yes, if you okay, yeah, that makes perfect sense. All right. How about, um, of course, the new one went off. Well, good stuff. It's, yeah, that'll be a driver. That'll yeah. be a driver in a small code. Yeah, it could be, yeah. What we're talking about now is a vulnerability assessment. Yeah. Right. Which, yeah. which lights are probably the most prominent. And I think I gave you a short list a little while ago. If it's impounded where there isn't much water passing through it, that pretty much stays in place. If it allows for buildup of nutrients, because it's within a watershed that has a lot of runoff from urban homes, it could be an unstored watershed where there's many septic systems. The nutrients, NMP, are making its way into that lake. And so with time, that Phosphorus especially will build up and stay in the sediments. It just doesn't go yeah. away. So when, that, when those water bodies heat up, as they will in July and August, uh, if your phosphorus levels are fairly high, you're going to be favoring cyanobacteria big time. The lake that I live next to is, is 300 acres. It's 10 meters deep. It, it never used to stratify. Now it's stratified. It gets up to 28 degrees C in the summer on the surface. And that lake used to always be clear. It didn't have cyanobacteria problems. And uh, back before the 70s, in, in the late mid 60s, or so they used it for hydropower. So they drew it down on a weekly basis, a couple feet, and then filled it back up. So it was getting all this groundwater in. So it was always clear. You had nice clear water. Plants didn't grow around the edge. Um, and they do it now. They dammed it for the summer, and they do weed control in the fall, and the thing's a mess. It's just, you know, they want to spend you know, $150,000 doing an alum treatment on one part of it, and as soon as they do the alum treatment, clear up the water, clarity, they're going to have prolific plant growth. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's kind of this, yeah. Mm -hmm. So all those drivers really come into play. So. Any other questions? That's kind of it for my, my talking session. Now I can pull out the... Uh, scopes, kind of get those set up. We can go do some plankton toes if people just want to see how those tools work. And then I've got some samples already set up that people can put on the microscope and kind of just work with it and see how it works. Uh, yes? I was confused about one thing, and that's the relationship between the fluorometer and the kit. Is that a necessary 
thing to have with the kit, or is that the next level above? It's kind of, it, the flyometer is the cyanomonitoring component. This is the cyanoscope component. So this is just for identifying species any time you want to collect them. If you're going to get into that dynamic of tracking what your lake is doing through the course of the season, seeing that transition period, you really need the fluorometry to do that. And that doesn't mean you necessarily have to buy one, you just have to find someone that has one and kind of work that out. So, but we feel 